Grit is defined as, in my mind, as your resilience towards long-term goals. Um, so if whether the life you want is huge or not so big, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You're going to face highs and lows. And if you change your mind every time the wind blows a different, if you take your time to write this vision down and the wind blows a different direction or the economy goes down and you decide that you're going to give up on your dreams and do something else, then you don't have grit. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Moeller Real Estate and Business Podcast. I'm your host, Phil Moeller, and on this podcast, we will be interviewing guests that have made their mark in real estate, in business, and in other areas of life. Listening to podcasts myself has helped me in so many different ways and continues to do so. If you're a real estate investor or an entrepreneur or aspiring to be either, or just someone that wants to learn, you've come to the right place. An easy way to have an impact is to share this episode with friends or family, provide a review, or just spread the word. We greatly appreciate it. And now let's get to the show. Okay. Welcome back, everyone, to the Mola Real Estate and Business Podcast. Very excited for today's guest, Pat Flynn. Pat, how are you doing today, man? What's up, Phil? Doing great. Doing great. Good to see you. Uh, for the audience, Pat, I've gotten to know Pat over the last three years or so. Amazing guy. Pat has flipped over a thousand houses, has built a very, very significant rental portfolio. He's involved in lending. Um, he, he has done a lot in his local area to help other real estate agents, flippers, and others build a mastermind group of, of sorts around it. And recently, he has tra transitioned over the last year or so into home building, which I know we'll get into more. So um, very excited, very excited to get into the details of this, Pat, and really maybe that transition eventually. But before we go there, how, how did this all start? Maybe, maybe just within the real estate story, what, what were the events that led up to kind of real estate as, a, as an avenue for you? Sure. So um, thanks for that intro too. That was, that was really nice. Um, I'm from a small town in, in Western Massachusetts, kind of small New England town. Always, my old man was uh, in the Marine Corps. So obviously I wanted to be in the Marine Corps. So I went to military school um, out, of, out of high school, a school called Kings Point in New York, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, which if you've ever read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, that is where also where Robert Kiyosaki, okay. uh, went to school and I, I played rugby there. The Kings Point rugby alumni community is really tight. He was also a Kings Point rugby guy. Um, so Interesting. he, yeah, it's kind of cool. Uh, he comes back to Kings Point every once in a while to just speak to the senior class just for free because it's his alma mater. And I was fortunate enough when I was a senior, um, to have him come and speak. And I've always like, you know, you kind of have that um, entrepreneurial spirit when you're younger. I've always been like weirdly into money um, and growing up in very kind of liberal sort of Massachusetts. That was always like it was always shoved down, like suppressed sort of thing. And when yep. Robert Kiyosaki spoke um, my senior year at King's Point and he only talked for like a half hour, but it was completely reinvigorated. Um, and, uh, from that point on, I just, obviously I read rich dad, poor dad, and I've just been reading ever since. Um, but that was really the seed, the spark, um, that reignited it. Um, and I graduated college in 2009. And so during the great recession, so it was really hard to screw something up in real estate during that time period. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so I bought my first piece of land in 2010 um, while I was on a ship and kind of just went from there. Um, but that's how I got into it. And it, you know, a lot of it is luck, right? Cause I wanted to get into real estate. I had no idea what I was doing, but like I said, really hard to buy a bad deal um, in 2010. Right. <laughs> Especially if you sit and hold it for a while. Yep. So you bought your first deal, and by the way, Kiyosaki has been brought up a couple of different times. Uh, I mean, I've read it a couple of times. I try to hand out that book. Just a completely different mindset and philosophy of money, and and you know maybe not traditional. So I encourage people to check that out if you haven't already. You bought that first land piece of land in 2010, and how did that go? And more importantly, how did that lead to the next thing thing or things? 
So I just uh, I I bought it so cheap, right? It was out of it was a short sale. Okay. And so me and my dad kind of worked together to figure out what a short sale was and how to short the bank on it. And it was a piece of lakefront property that I ended up buying for sixty thousand dollars, which was nothing. And I'd look at like different online like tax websites and stuff and saw that it was worth significantly more right in 2004. So I was kind of wrapping my head around values yep. and the fact that values drop significantly during that great recession. At the time I look back and I, you know, I, I was pretty oblivious to it. You go to a military school and you're like, I'm, you know, you don't have a ton of time off and you're kind of closed in that place. Yep. So when 2008 hit, it was very painful for a lot of people. I, was was unaware, just completely yeah. unaware that anything had even happened in in the outside world because we were in our bubble there. So I was kind of learning buying that for so cheap forced me to learn about values, and that led to you know kind of the next deal and the next deal, and uh, just kind of figuring it out from there. But it's that's the first time and like I've been asked a question like that, and you really to put yourself back at twenty one years old when you haven't done a ton of research on this stuff. Um, it was it was interesting, right? I was learning about the Great Recession in, in 2010. Obviously, I knew something bad happened. Yeah, right. Uh, learning about real estate values and how much they really declined during that time period. So, so you bought that first piece of land in 2010, and then you said the next couple of deals. What are the next? You've done a lot of transactions, like a lot of transactions, and we'll, we'll come back to that more. But what did the next couple of years look like in in within real estate and and were you working this whole time as well? What did that look like? Yeah, so I was fortunate enough um, to be working six, seven, eight months a year on ships, and then when I wasn't on a ship, I was just home, um, so I could focus on this stuff. And uh, these first couple years, I focused on. I, I bought that piece of land, but I focused more on just building up cash reserves in the bank. I did do buy two other houses in Massachusetts and just rented them out. So those were the next two. They were just kind of deals, just sniffing around uh, the MLS and finding like a nice uh, brick or block house in Massachusetts that was cheap and the rental numbers worked. Um, I read, I was big into rentals back then rather than flipping. So I read yep. everything I could about uh, how, how rentals work, what cap rates were, um, what were good cash flows, bad cash flows, good assets and bad assets. So these first, so 2010, 11, and 12, I bought that land in 2010, in 2012, I think 2000, I might have bought one house a year. So maybe one house in 2011, one in 2012. And then in 2013, I moved to Florida. And when I moved, I sold everything up in Massachusetts. Okay. Is that the big pivot? So when I think of you, just from getting to know you over the last couple of years, I think scale and um, you know everything you're going to do. You're you're thinking about how to do things and set them up for scale. When did that like did that start in this time period? When so you moved to Florida? I, I forgot to mention earlier, but Pat's out of Jacksonville, Florida. But you moved to Florida at that time. Is that like was this the theme or the thought process of scale on your mind then, or was it kind of no slow and steady, and there was a pivot at some point? Scale wasn't at all um, on my mind then. The only thing on my mind then was I do not want to work. At that time, I had went from from working on oil tankers to oil rigs, um, so offshore drilling off the coast of Scotland. Um, did a lot of work in Singapore and in the Gulf of Mexico. So I knew it was good work for a twenty-something year old. Like good hard work, le learned a lot out there. But I knew that wasn't where I was going to be forever. So the yep. focus on that time was very slow and steady of uh, let's burr method. Let's see if I can surpass my income by flipping and, um, and wholesaling and doing rentals. So 2013, I moved to Florida, uh, was still very much worried. I was probably offshore eight months a year. So I was making great money. Uh, and it was kind of hard to get traction. Once I moved to Florida, I immediately, you know, joined all the networking events in Florida for real estate investors. I had some cash from the stuff in Massachusetts. So um, I bought three rental units um, in Florida and started sending out a bunch of marketing kind of wholesaling stuff. And during that time period, kind of interesting, 
um, it's long days on, on the rigs. It's, it's 12 hour shifts. So six in the morning to six at night. And then you usually do four hours of overtime, seven days a week. So it's six o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, seven days a week out there. And we have like three satellite phones on the rig. So okay. every single night at 10, I would go to the satellite phones and check my Google voicemail and see if any of my marketing stuff had hit and need to see if any sellers <laughs> had called. Um, as you can imagine, didn't do a ton of deals that way, but it forced the momentum of me committing and spending money on marketing and going to these networking events and meeting the players in Jacksonville to where in 2016, um, when my girlfriend got pregnant while I was in, uh, you know, I found out she FaceTimed me when I was in Australia and she's like, Hey, I'm pregnant. It's like, whoo, life's about to change pretty quick. <laughs> I needed to, uh, cause I, we didn't have any family in Florida. So, um, at that point I quit offshore, offshore drilling in 2016 started full time, but luckily I had always been good with my money. So I had a bunch of money saved up. Um, this transition wasn't super difficult because I had been in the space since 2010, kind of slow, but I was still doing marketing and going to these networking events. And I, I was plugged in already. You know what I mean? I wasn't like reading a book for the first time in 2016 when I quit. Right. So right. it was an easy transition. Once I, once I was home full time and I got really focused on the marketing piece of it, uh, 2016, 2017 was a fantastic time to market in Jacksonville, Florida. We did, I did really well, um, the first year. And then, uh, I, I met my business partner in early 2017 and we partnered up in mid 2018. Um, it's also when I met uh, a friend of mine, Don Wenner, um, who is, who is, um, one of the best, I think at, at scaling and just, just operating a very smooth business. And I learned about a lot of that stuff from Don actually. And that all started in mid 2018 with the Okay. Albert. Okay. And so, so 20, 2016, you quit, you really started to focus on marketing. I mean, you were, were you like the marketing and the marketing strategy and wholesaling, first of all, within real estate, if we talked real estate specifically for a little bit, um, you're spending money out of pocket in, with the assumption you're going to, you're going to get that in deals. How, what kind of spend or what did that look like? Yeah. That, that, I mean, great question. And I remember it vividly because it's so painful now. Um, it was, it ended up being, I did a ton of postcards and a ton of bandit signs. And, and that was really all I was doing. I was doing some like um, local coupon magazines, but back then $2,000 like clockwork, $2,000 worth of postcard bought a deal every like, like clockwork over and over again. I spend two grand worth of postcards. I get a deal. And I was spending, you know, I, I was spending 15, 20 grand a month back then. Um, so we were doing, I, I was doing a good amount of deals. And, and I say we, um, because I wholesaled a lot, but I also JV'd a lot during that time period. Okay. And if there's anyone new to this, listening to your podcast, it's like, that is a great way to get started is don't like if I had bought all those deals myself and tried to flip them and manage contractors and do deals, I would have failed. Right. Yeah. But because I JV'd with some people, I, I, I borrowed money and let other people do the renovations and just take a smaller piece of the profit. I was able to do way more deals. It's, um, it sounds like, I mean, me. you were looking for, first of all, you were leveraging the time you had and the strengths you had is what I just heard is that, okay, what is t time available? You could, you could do some hustle where maybe some partners or other people had money, but they didn't have the time to hustle right. at this time. I don't think the you want. Had, what's that or the want, right? You yeah, know, yeah, laziness yeah. kicks in a little bit when money's just sitting in the bank, but you didn't necessarily have the capital yourself at this time to go do a lot of deals. So you were partnering with people to do it. Um, and you had the knowledge to do it as well. Is that, I mean, I, I, I just, again, in general, you figured out what you can do and then leveraged and partners with other, with others to accelerate your growth. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you, you know, entering this space, you know, a lot of people enter the wholesale route because uh, that's one of the greatest and worst things about the wholesale business is there is no moat whatsoever. Come to your market, spend a little bit in marketing and be right there with you in front of, in front of those sellers on those deals. Yes. Yeah, like it takes time to learn sales techniques and there's some nuances to it. 
Um, but it is a great entry point just because you need a little cash for marketing money or a little bit of time to hustle phone numbers, but, um, very low mo business and a great way to get, to get into it. So what was next? So 2018 timeframe, you're, you're kicking off. I think it's when you started Yellowbird and more flipping and that really, right. was there like a shift there to, okay, how do we grow this? How do we scale this? How many can we do? How, like, what did that transition look like? Yeah, 20, 2018 was the big shift of me really having business partners and not being like kind of just the one guy doing sales for myself anymore. Where before I was like just running all my marketing, doing my own thing. In 2018, I was forced to, you know, or not forced to, I wanted to um, step into more of a leadership role and run salespeople. Um, and help people learn this business and start to make money and have uh, have a team under me. Um, and that was that was that transition point there. Um, and I learned a lot during that time period about the importance of vision, the importance of accountability. And I learned all that by um, completely uh, screwing it up uh, the first couple of times around. <laughs> so 2018, I think to 2023, you really grew this business um quite a bit i mean what did what did at the peak uh maybe this was 2022 but at the peak of your flipping business what did that look like uh, maybe transaction volume sales whatever sure. you want to share so yeah and i'll just give you every year so it doesn't look like a crazy transition but uh 20 20 2017 i remember i did 72 deals total um, 2018, uh, with, with my, me and my business partner together, we were probably in the, you know, 175 range. And that big jump was be from adding a business partner to, it wasn't from adding a sales team. So that was like me and him combined. Yep. Um, and then 2019 was probably two mid two hundreds. And that was from adding a salesperson and me and my business partner hustling pretty hard. Our peak was 2021, 2022, which was a lot of people's peak in the single <laughs> single family business. Yep. But uh, at our peak, we were had about 55 employees um, that included all the property management people and VAs and everything and a 12 person um, sales team that I ran. And uh, we did 425 deals that year. So bought 425 single family homes in 2021. And in 2022, we were just around the same. We were around 420 deals. So we were humming there uh, for a little bit. So just to put it in, con I'm sure people are doing the math, but 425 deal, I mean, darn near, not quite 10 a week, but yeah. more than one a day. You're yes. doing it. You're doing a deal. You're closing a deal. And by the way, every deal is is typically two transactions. You're buying it and you're selling it. If you're flipping it, I know you held some of those throughout that process too, but yep. it, and if just for the audience, I mean, this is where Pat is a, a leadership guy, but also systems processes structure. Like you have to, you couldn't even get to 425 deals if you didn't do that. Or if you try to do 425 deals, you would be working nonstop. You'd probably be losing money if you didn't have this, if the structure, the people, the process, all that stuff in place. So just to, I guess, I'm trying to give context to the audience of of who you are and and how you structure and set things up as we as we transition into the next part of the discussion. So, twenty twenty so with that, like you you can add as much structure as you want to flipping that many houses, like but it is loose at best. As much as I love good systems and processes and discipline and following them. I mean, good luck buying 425 houses that all different ages, uh, 12 crazy salespeople, you know, all in their, all in their twenties running yep. hard, um, and going on, you know, 15 appointments a week each and having to look, it was just, it was a chaotic time. So what Very was good. the, so if it was, I mean, so what was the key to success for those two years? Like if you, in, like what was, what made you win during yep. that time period? extreme discipline with the salespeople. Um, I had a phenomenal team. Uh, I love them. The deal is made on the front end, the sale on the back end. It didn't matter as long as you bought a good deal. And I was extremely overly focused on the front end because, you know, you remember during those time periods, as long as you bought 
pretty well. It was hard to get hurt. Um, so the key to success was extreme discipline with the sales crew, uh, extreme discipline with my numbers. So at, at our peak, we were spending four hundred, four hundred fifty thousand dollars a month on marketing, um, and we knew our numbers to a T. Exactly how much a deal costs, how much a lead costs per marketing source, where the, where the deals were coming from. So uh, we were crazy about analytics, crazy about salespeople discipline, and you have some stuff slip through the cracks, of course, but that was where the money was made during that time period. So the discipline with the sales team, I mean, you said sales team and numbers, but the discipline with the sales team, does that mean like setting goals, setting metrics, holding them accountable, following numbers, like uh, leads, lead generation process? Like what is that? What, do you, what is discipline with the sales team mean? It means all those things. Um, it, it's, it's an 845 meeting in the in, uh, seven days a week. Um, no, it's, we didn't do it Sunday, but 845 meeting Monday through Saturday, everything you were doing that day. Hey, what's your one thing, your most important thing? It's uh, two sales accountability meetings a week where we go over everyone's numbers. Um, it's a sales training once a week. It's operating in traction. So every single salesperson has individualized goals and numbers to hit based on ultimately the income they want to make this year. And we had all the conversion rates. So it was as simple as you need to go on this many appointments to do this many deals and to make those appointments, you need this many phone calls. And like it's, it was pure math at that point. And you, and, knew, and you knew that from the beginning, I mean, you referenced the $2,000 from the start. Yeah. So you were paying attention to what is my spend? What are my people like? What are the phone calls I need to make? What is basically the whole lead funnel need to look like? to get right. this result. And you had that dialed into a point where you knew, okay, if we spend this much money or make this many phone calls or take these actions, basically, this will be the output unless the market changes or something else. Right, which it did. So so I think uh, he's laughing if you're watching the video and I know this story a little bit. So let's talk about that next, Pat. Let's talk about um, the end of 22, 2023, kind of what's going through your mind and the, the, big, the big shift. So at that point, we were off, we were off to the races, right? 2021, early 2022, we were rolling. Uh, I didn't hear a whole lot from my business partner just because I, I was kind of running the company because there wasn't a lot to say, really. Things were flowing. It was a little chaotic, yes, but we were making really good money month over month. And then in June 2022, I remember it vividly. I was up in Baltimore at a, um, uh, a mastermind event. Uh, the Fed um, bumped the overnight rate, I think, 50 bips in one meeting, right? That, I think that was June 2022. And everything changed in Jacksonville at that point. Um, by everything changed, I mean our main buyers at that point were, you know, these funds where we'd package up deals and 15, 20 house deals and sell it to these hedge funds, they all went away overnight. Overnight, that bid was gone. So yeah. you have this inventory. We never got sloppy with our buying, right? We never, but we had, you know, probably a $35 million balance sheet at that point. And rather than not taking a lot of work to sell these houses and sell them to a fund, these houses now all need to be individually flipped. They weren't selling for as much. There was much more pain in the selling process because these fund relationships were over. You're now selling to end buyers. Yep. So the market didn't fall off, but what we needed to do to sell these guys is a lot more friction there. Um, and everyone got a little nervous at that point. So um yeah, we just we just had to completely completely shift what we were doing at that point. And I think I think it speaks to first of all when you're doing things at scale, make sure um, you have just different different exit options, and also like you're just aware of the the situations that could come up. I mean, were you you weren't ready for that though? Like you mentioned your discipline in buying, and that probably maybe saved you, but you were not ready for what happened on that day. No. Not at all. Not even a little bit. Um, but we were, what happened was we were disciplined buying. So on individual house level yep. throughout the end of that year, we were still making money. We weren't losing money on real estate, but I had mentioned we we're spending $450,000 a month in marketing yep. and our buying really slowed down. Plus we had, you know, we had 54, 55 employees at the time. We had expense creep 
throughout that is when things are really good. Who cares? Just spend yep. it. Spend yep. by different softwares and little shit we didn't need around the office. And it creeped up a lot. Yep. So to the end of that year, we started losing we, in the last quarter. Um, I feel like I've, I think I've showed you the financials for that last quarter, Phil. We lost money every single month. Once again, yep. not because of real estate. We were making money on these flips. It's just we didn't have as great of margins as we did before, and we had expense creep. So what that led to was extreme disagreements on path forward between me and uh, my business partner at the so, time. The end so of 2022 was a not a great time. And I want to get into that, but before we do, I think I think maybe just a note on the economy is, I, I think dips in the economy sometimes can really make you like you, you said, spending was maybe getting a little bit of loose. You were just, you were making money hand over foot. Like Very it was loose. going really well, but sometimes a correction is good for your own business and kind of just seeing what's going on and what you're like, how profitable you, you probably could have been. You could have made more money at the same time. If you weren't adding fuel to the fire, maybe it would have slowed down your growth too. So I, I think just being aware of that, quite frankly, is important for business owners, real estate investors, whoever it might be. So I want to come back to, now this transition. So you just talked through what led up to this transition, end of 2022, beginning of 2023. Um, you know, I kind of worked through that process with you, but talk through the mindset during this time period and, and just thinking what was going through your head. So the, the basic disagreement between me and my partner at the time, and once again, I wasn't necessarily right. Um, or wrong. And he wasn't necessarily right or wrong. We're just different people. Yep. Um, he, he basically wanted to shut it down and go back to really just me and him and a couple of helpers um, and just kind of wait this out and see what was going to happen, which, you know, w once again, wasn't, wasn't wrong, but uh, it wasn't necessarily him that built up the team and the processes and the yep. systems and the leadership and everyone there. So I cared deeply about it. And I would, I convinced myself that it could be saved. It just needed a pivot. Um, I have always kind of, I knew I wouldn't end up in the, we buy houses business. I've never really liked it for myself. I don't see myself there 10 years from now, not putting the business down at all. It's a fantastic business, but I really enjoy scale and growth and leadership. And it's just not really, it's not really necessary in that business. I think the yep. most efficient way to run it's just with a small team. So I saw myself leaving it anyway, and I wanted to keep my team and pivot. And he didn't want that. Um, and once again, neither of us are right or wrong. So I spent the end of that year grinding hard on what was going to be our pivot. Um, because I'm trying to sell my business partner on a pivot that he didn't really want to make. Um, in the first place. So I'm coming up with all these ideas and business plans and I was working long hours to do so and just kept getting shut down and, and uh, you know, not agreeing with me because basically he wanted something different. And it was a very frustrating time period, not only for, for me and him, but um, I hated, I hated that those disagreements, how they filtered down to the office. Yeah. I saw what could happen to an office and people I really care about when there's no clear vision, when leaders don't agree on a path forward, it is poison to an operation. Looking back, the right thing to do probably was just put everyone out of their misery rather than put them through those months of me and him disagreeing and going back and forth. So you, you, you had this time period where you didn't, you didn't really know what to do though. So like, what do you, what do you do in that time period? I mean, what, like, what do you do when you don't, you were, you were unclear. So what was the process? What, like, what were you thinking? What, what did you do when you didn't know what to do? Step one for me was, Hey, I can't figure this out. It's time to work harder. Um, so that's what I did. I, I worked really hard. I worked really long hours. Um, and Phil, you've seen some of this stuff too. I made spreadsheets of business plans and different routes to go and tried to figure out what the strengths of the team were. Um, Cause ultimately I was not passionate about We Buy Houses. I'm not necessarily passionate about any particular business. I'm passionate about leadership and growing a team. So I, I was looking for something that was a little more systemizable that had, that had ability to scale. And I worked 
really hard, really long hours trying to figure out, pitching different ideas, calling business brokers. Um, and I felt like the harder I worked, um, the further I got away from the answer. Um, and the breakthrough was when I decided to go the other direction um, and focus not on work for a little bit and just spend more time with my family because that situation was getting a little stressed because of as much as I was working. So I started just not working at all on weekends, not even a little bit. And I started taking Wednesdays off too um, and just hanging with the wife. Um, I changed up my diet a little bit. My workouts started getting more on point. Um, I started reading more kind of fiction and random stuff. So I stopped working even Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, when I did work, like it was very half-assed. I'd like answer, <laughs> I'd answer emails for a little bit, uh, maybe do like a couple of deals, maybe buy something, but it was not, I was not working hard. I was working out a lot, like taking two hour lunches to work out, going to lunch and breakfast with Jane and my relationship with my wife got better. My relationship with my kids got better. Um, I got in even better shape. I felt even I was getting better sleep. And that's when things started to become clear. So it's crazy. It's counterintuitive, right? Yep. I thought I had to work really hard to find this answer, but instead I focused on myself and the answer became really clear. Man, there is there is a lot to unpack there. So first of all, we kind of talked about the economy and the challenges and what it can do. And um, just like in your business, it can make you look at things closer. But then it got to a point where it didn't, you weren't really doing that. And you're like, I just need to step away and get out of your business, right? You're, and until you got out of your business, could you, like you were working so hard in your business during that time period and grinding and trying to figure things out not until you got out of your business, stepped away, did you get more clarity on, okay, this is the direction I think I need to go. So I think the lesson for the listeners is just, if you're in your business constantly day to day and in the weeds and in the details, you are not going to have the impact you can on your business if you're a 10,000 feet out of the business overseeing things and, and quite frankly, getting away from the stresses of the day-to-day -day parts of it. At least that was my takeaway from it. Let me, let me do one one more thing from what you said there phil uh because i think when when you make the uh uh the you make the accusation that someone's working in their business not on it i don't think i was doing that i i wasn't working in the business day to day i was trying to vision for what this business was path forward i i felt like i, I was at that 30,000 okay. foot level trying to look forward i needed to stop working completely yeah. not not on the business not not on systems process i just needed to stop working and focus on my wife yep I, I needed to focus on calling my friends i need to focus on working out um and just spending time outside not working um that's where that's where the breakthrough and came. i think it's getting so i think maybe it's said differently is it's the keep getting farther away from your business and that's when the break, you had to get really far away from your business to get the breakthrough. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just, there's different, maybe there's different levels of that if I, if I were to say it differently. So what did you pivot to? What did you do? So you had the breakthrough, you got clarity in 2023. What was the next thing? Sure. So um, I had mentioned before, we are, I, I was good with this. I was good with running the sales team and I enjoyed it, but I think it took years off my life as well. And I didn't want to go back to a sales oriented business. Um, what I really enjoyed was working with my leadership team on systems, process, operational stuff. So I mentioned before I was looking for something a little more of a widget-based business that had the potential to scale. Um, home flipping can only be scaled a certain level. I want to work with high-level people. So I needed a business that had legs beyond Jacksonville that could that could grow bigger. So um, that was that was the first requirement. Um, the second requirement is that you need to be kind of a fit for us. So I looked at every scalable business you could imagine, including like, like I was looking at like bail bonds. I was, I was going all that down these crazy roads, but I had spent the last since 2010, like learning and being involved in the real estate community. So I had built all these real estate connections, which take a lot of time and are not easy to just create overnight. So I'm like, why would I completely leave all this work I've done in the real estate world 
um, to go do to go run McDonald's franchises or something like that. Even though I do, uh, I don't necessarily care about the business. We already have our roots here. We already yep. know what a transaction is. We already know all the hard money lenders. You know, we already know all the wholesalers. So um, I loved the home building route because it is a widget based scalable business that also has a, a very important real estate component um, and a very important capital component, uh, which I felt like I had skill. I have skill sets in all three of those pieces. So it just became so clear that this was the perfect path for us, a widget based business of building a house to in teaming it up with um, a little bit of development problem solving, a little bit of capital problem solving and buying land. Um, and we already had kind of those connections. So it was just the perfect, not only the perfect business for us and my team, but it was the perfect time too, because things were cooling down. Um, vendors started picking up their phones because things weren't as crazy as they were. And, uh, um, the transition has been so natural and, and just felt so right. Um, and what, what stands out for me there is is you're, you started to evaluate different businesses, different options, but what was really key in that process. So if you're, if you're thinking about a transition or a change in your career, in your business, in real estate, whatever it is for the audience, get clarity on the requirements and what you want first, and then see what fits within that versus going and looking for every single type of business or whatever it might be and saying, can you, you know, can you fit the square peg into a round hole? You got crystal clear on what you wanted, why you wanted it. And then you said, okay, what fits this? And then you, you took off and, and we're flying, right? We were off to flight. So tell me about flight since um, just a few minutes left here, Pat, but since early last year until today, and I think a big week this week as well, but what has, what has changed over the last 10 months or so? Can I make one more quick point just based uh, on- Please. Um, so exactly what you just said to Phil, and I'd, I'd add on to that and say, make sure that when you're doing that, that your goals are your own, right? I knew that I wanted to go down the road of, of scaling something because that's who I am and that's what I enjoy. It's not necessarily the right route for everyone, right? And going down the road of like, just, I could have easily gone down the road of just liquidating all of our balance sheets, I had plenty of money in the bank and flipped houses for the rest of my life, very stress-free, made great money with a small team and just roll with that forever. Lent, lent some money, did some deals just here and there with a small team. And it would be way less stressful than my yep. life is now, yep. right? But I can sleep good at night and feel in my gut that every, that everything I'm doing is right because I know I made these decisions for the right reasons yep. and going down and feeling this pain that we're in now with, with flight, which, you know, flight's new. It's a startup. You're going to go through pain. You're going to have issues, but I'm better fit to deal with this pain because I know that this is what I want. And I put deep thought into these goals and I know they're my own. And I think so. society can put so much pressure on what we do, why we do it. I think, sure. I mean, so make sure your goals are your own and get clarity on the requirements and what you want. Those are so important because Otherwise, who are we doing it for, right? And again, I think society can put a lot of pressures on us or, you know, we, we had this conversation, oh, do I have to now go do that thing for somebody else? Make sure you feel really, really good about it and have clarity as to what you want and why you want it. So I love that. So what's happened in the last 10 months since, since you've launched Flight? Cool. So um, I feel like it is a big, in, in June, May of June of 2020, 2023, um, it was just a big cloud of dust. There's all these ambiguous problems that need solving. Um, and throughout the last 10 months, gravity has just been slowly pulling it together. Um, because what we're trying to do is unique and we're not, uh, we're, we're building to be able, we're building a company that can build 450 houses three years from now. So, um, the vision was clear on the volume I wanted to do. So it made the decisions in the now easier. Like, obviously, we even though QuickBooks Online is only $200 a month, it was clear that we could not use that software. Um, even Builder Trend is cheap and easy, and we can make it work with Google Sheets, just was not an option for what yep. we're doing. So 
Um, we had to solve a lot of software problems and a, a lot of problems with our accounting software and issues with, right, you're hiring talented people quickly because you need to grow quickly. But to do that, you also need house volume rolling through. So we're just fighting a lot of fronts at one time. Um, but the vision in the end um, has made it clearer. So having that clear vision of where you're going makes decisions easier in the now and makes you know the pain a little easier as you go through them. I mean, I, I wrote it down before you said, but yeah, vision, the, having a clear vision makes the decisions for you. And quite frankly, your team quite is probably making decisions because they have, they understand what the vision is. Um, and I know you spent a lot of time. We had a guest a couple of weeks ago too, that spent a lot of time on a vivid vision, but I think you use the model from the book, vivid visions to create that. What is that? Like, that's a, that's a five page document, seven page document, very detailed where you're going. What, what does that include? What does sure, your vivid so, vision include? I mean, so a vivid vision is three years. So there's some science behind, um, was it Cameron Harold that wrote that book? It, it's good. Um, uh, there's some science behind humans thinking in, in terms of three years, because it's not too far out in the future to where it's like an untouchable time point and it's not too close to where it's right here. It's a good goal timeline he yep. talks about. There's some science behind it. So what the vivid vision is, essentially is you painting the picture of exactly what your organization looks like three years from now. And you write the entire document as if you're already there. So it is very personal document. I'm happy to share mine with anyone. But if you, if you go through Cameron Harold's examples of different people's vivid vision, they're all a little different, right? Um, they all kind of start with a snapshot of what the organization looks like three years from now, but then the rest of it is just, kind of values. I have a whole page on culture. I have a whole page on leadership. Um, I decided to write a whole page about why we made the transition from flipping houses to building houses. Um, I have my vision for the future of how much volume flight is doing, um, how we're going to structure our land positions um, with a fund and how that looks for the employees. And then at the end, I just wrote my, uh, I call it the theory on life. Um, it's just kind of my why. Um, and spent a whole quarter writing that. And uh, Elena, who works with me and does a lot of marketing, kind of put it together. And it turned out as kind of our guidebook for the future to be referenced at any time. And it's just, it was, it was some of the best work uh, I've done that quarter because like you said phil it gives everyone guidance in the office and i would just any again any business leaders quite frankly not just business leaders business owners real estate investors but getting clear on your vision this doesn't need to be a business topic right this can be a business and personal topic any area of life getting clarity as to what you want where you're going and then using that three-year marker and designing your life around what you're looking for i think is a very very valuable process Absolutely. Uh, I think Cameron Harold and the, some of the examples he has are he, his vivid vision just for his personal life and his family. So that was actually my rock um, last quarter was uh, doing my, my personal one. It's just, it's a weird thing happens when you write it, Phil. Um, and I know I was telling you like six months ago when I finished this one, it's like, it, it almost feels like it becomes inevitable. If you take the time to write it and Elena, like me and Elena working together on the aesthetic of it, the pictures and went through the printing process and I hand it to everyone and everyone that will take it from me, I hand it to and email it to people. It almost makes it feel like it's inevitable at that point. And your whole team has seen it and read it and can make day-to-day -day decisions based on this, on this book. Like a very unique thing happens um, if you take the time to do it. Man, that's awesome. Well, uh, so real quick, you had a big day yesterday. I think you said it was yesterday, t yesterday or today. So apologies for that. But what was that and how did that feel? This morning, uh, we got our first certificate of occupancy on our first house we built. We started it in October. And uh, I think we poured the slab like around Halloween. And uh, we just got our CO today. So it took about five months, four and a half months to do, but that includes the holidays too. And no one felt like working in the holidays. And by no one, I mean like vendors and that sort of stuff. So it didn't, not, not a lot got done Christmas and New Year's. 
And we still did it in like four and a half months and kind of proved the concept that we could build and CEO a house with the team we have. And it was just so exciting. It was this morning. Um, the, the whole just the, team, just, it, just a great feeling. Like, tell me about uh, that a little bit more. It's is it validates what you're doing, right? Because there's a lot of us starting this home building company. There's a lot of negativity behind it because we are, we are very much screwing up the old guard that's here in Jacksonville. Right. So a lot of negativity, a lot of calling vendors, telling them not to work for us. There's all sorts of shit going on behind the scenes, all sorts of people saying we couldn't do it. And the fact that we just CO'd our first house is so incredibly validating. We have a long way to go. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to lie. We're still in the danger zone. We're still a startup. We still need things to flow. Um, but this point shows that we can do it. And it gives every, like everyone at the office now sees, holy shit, we just CO'd a house. We have permits flowing through. Maybe this is possible, right? right. I mean, I hope they believe me on a day to day. But and think about what the team has. Think about what the team has learned by doing the first. Like the first one is by far the hardest one. It oh, is the man. most challenging one to make the make the decision on, pull the trigger, get done, figure out the process. There's so much to it. Everyone only gets easier from here. Absolutely, especially if you have your meeting structure and you talk through problems. Um, so, absolutely, I appreciate that. Well, congratulations, Pat. That is very, very exciting. All right, I want to shift gears a little bit. Through all this process, what would you say is your key factor of success? I would say something we talk about all the time, and it's one of our one of our core values, is not only vision, but grit. So we already touched on it in this call, Phil, is is taking the time to actually set up your vision that is authentic to who you are. So that's step one, taking the time alone to think about your vision for who you are in all areas of your life with your family, the people you hang out with, your business, your money. Um, don't set your money goals based on the Kardashians scrolling in the strolling Instagram, set it up based on the life that you want not the life you know you think people think you're cool if you have. Yep. So authenticity and vision, right? And then having grit. So grit is defined as in my mind as your resilience towards long-term goals. Um so if whether the life you want is huge or not so big, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You're going to face highs and lows and if you change your mind Every time the wind blows a different, if you take your time to write this vision down and the wind blows a different direction or the economy goes down and you decide that you're going to give up on your dreams and do something else, then you don't have grit. And a lot of people do that. So taking the time to be authentic and set goals and having the grit um, to stick with it hard a lot. Um, but having that resilient, knowing that you're working towards things that matter and mean something to you. And having to grit to stick in it um, when things are difficult, I think is the most defining characteristic of success. I love it. That's good stuff, man. And so, um, man, I keep hearing the word, I love the word authenticity, by the way. Like what is it? Again, you said it earlier in the podcast and in, in this show, but what the goals have to be for you. They have to be real. They have to be authentic. Um, so I just, I like that a lot. What about, I want to Another di different question. What is a personal habit that you are working on for yourself today? So recently, probably the biggest breakthrough I had was living at inbox zero. Um, and I do that by whenever I have a to do go in my inbox, it goes from my inbox and I put it on my calendar in a half hour segment. So Phil, if you send me a video you want me to watch on YouTube, motivational video that's 15 minutes long, that video until I have time to watch it is going to sit and rot in my inbox, maybe for months. Maybe I never watch it because it disappears in my hundred item inbox. But now you send me that video, I take it and I move it to maybe 45 days from now. Maybe, maybe three months from now, I put this video, Phil, just based on calendar availability. But now my inbox is clean, and now that item has a spot. 
And what I'm working on now is being true to myself with it, right? Because sometimes I'll put stuff on the calendar and I'll miss it again. Uh, so do operating this way and putting stuff on the calendar based on a priority sort of basis will make your vacations better, your downtime better, because you can look at this clear inbox and know that every item in there is in its place rather than just in a cluster that you have to redig through every time you're like, oh, fuck, I gotta get in this inbox again and go through it. So it's been a fantastic change in my life, but I'm still not quite there yet and, and missing things sometimes yeah. on the calendar and it'll stack up again. But once I can get that, to a point. That's huge um, for productivity. That's a big one. Yeah. Um, favorite business or real estate book? Um, my favorite one, I'll give you my two favorite books of 2023. Um, and, and I've gifted them a lot too, is Courage is Calling, Ryan Holiday, and uh, Lessons for Living by Phil Stutz. I'm listening to that right now. Absolutely um, fantastic. Yeah, it's good. You said the first one was Courage Courage is calling. Is calling. Brian Conde. Brian yeah. Good stuff. And what about personal development book? And maybe it's one of those too, but um, another one. I'll give you my favorite one uh, as of late that I'm just about to finish. It's the Arnold book. Um, Be useful. Absolutely fantastic. You got to listen to the audible version of you know him reading it. Um, just a lot of the themes that we've talked about today, Phil like having vision it's all this it's all the same like what success means being authentic selling your vision to others like it's all the same themes we talk about and it's just really cool to hear arnold talk about the ways those impact you know the same stuff we talk about on our calls or these podcasts it's like those are the same themes that arnold has lived by too um, it's honestly been it's been really interesting as i've done this just did the, started this podcast and there is there is definitely a lot of themes that just keep coming up over and over again maybe people use different words or explain them in slightly different ways that it, as it applies to them personally but the themes just keep coming up over and over again so couldn't agree with that more pat thanks so much um i really appreciate coming on so much value in a lot of different topics here how could people find out more about you uh sure so just look up um uh I think Instagram is just uh, Pat Pat Flynn or Pat Flynn STF. But I have a if you go to the flight website, which is flight.builders, um, I write an email every Friday. It's just a little tidbit on what I'm thinking. I more write it for myself uh, than anything else. But sign up for the Friday email list. I do a podcast every single week, not with guests, but I just I just I use it as like a um a audio journal for myself. So I talk about things that I need to hear. I say them out loud and I talk about what's going on with flight because I feel like it'll be really cool to look back on five, 10 years from now, what was going through my head at different points of time as, as flight was being built. Um, but I, it's, it's personal development stuff. And I'm, a lot of it is just advice for myself yep. uh, that I put out in the world because, you know, this ride is, is just it's stressful and it's not it's not for everybody and sometimes i have to talk myself on the ledge um every now and again every now and again and uh people people enjoy the the newsletter and the podcast well definitely check out flight.builders.com the email i get the email every friday flight.builders flight.builders check that out sorry about that um register register for the email i get the email every friday fantastic stuff from pat and just his thoughts again i i think a lot of this is Pat talked about it, but just think about the, the things that resonate with you. Why do they resonate with you? Talk about them with others, journal on them, things like that. And that, I think that's, Pat, that sounds like that's your forum to do that. So really appreciate that insight for everyone. Uh, we're, that's a wrap for the show. We went long today, but such good stuff we had to. I appreciate it, Pat. For the Mola Real Estate and Business Podcast, this is Phil signing off. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Mole Real Estate and Business Podcast. We hope you found today's episode helpful. If you know current or aspiring investors or entrepreneurs or anyone that would benefit from today's episode, we appreciate you sharing it with them or better yet, providing us a five-star review. To learn more about Molar Real Estate, visit our website at www.molarre.com. You can also sign up for our newsletter or local events via our website. In closing, I encourage you to be purposeful in all areas of life, educate yourself, network with others that have been successful, take action and lead. Thank you.